our worship. He is worthy. I don't know if you have read the book of Revelation. And John gives us a story. He saw a man on a throne, and that man had a scroll. A man on a throne having a scroll in his hand. And John said, he heard a loud voice as if they were making an announcement. And I said, who is able to take this scroll from the hand of the man who is sitting on this throne and open the seals thereof? Who can do that? For a moment, John tells us, the whole heaven was silent. Nobody was able to give an answer. And therefore John says, I wept bitterly because there was nobody. There was nobody. The story continues. As John was weeping, he heard a loud voice behind him saying, John, weep no more. Stop crying. Because somebody is ready to take the scroll from the hand of the one who is on the throne. Amen. The Lion of Judah is ready to do that. From the roots of Jesse, he is ready to take the scroll. And he said that he saw something or somebody like a lamb walking towards the one who sat on that throne. He stretches forth his hand and the man on the throne gives him the scroll. And John says, right after collecting the scroll from the man on that throne, he heard loud voices all over the place. Worthy is the Lamb. Yeah. Worthy is the Lamb. Yeah. I came here to tell you tonight, God is expecting us to worship Him in spirit and in truth because He is worthy. Amen. 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 Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Worship is not supposed to be just mechanical. Yeah. Worship is not something we do to please anybody. I want to worship God from my heart because He is worthy. Amen. Get into the world. Malachi 1. Old Testament book. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Chapter number 1. And what we want to remind ourselves of over here is that God deserves our worship. Malachi 1 and verse number 6, and I'm reading 6a. Here is God speaking to the children of Israel. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. So here is a big question. Is God your God? Is He your Lord? And the question is, if I am your father, I am your uh, your father. And if I am your master, where is my respect? Worship has to do with lighter word respect. Worship has to do with obedience. Obedience from the heart. Things that we want to do without compulsion. Nobody should force us to worship God. But our worship should come from our hearts. 
Because number one, we know him and we acknowledge him as our father. We know him as our Lord. And he asked the question over here. If then I am the father, where is my honor? Brothers and sisters, God demands worship from us. He demands our devotion. And it is up to all of us, individuals, to decide whether to be obedient or to be disobedient to the call of God. He is the master and he deserves everything that is beautiful in his sight. Where is my honor? Psalm number 8 and verse 3 to 8. David comes again and gives us an idea as to why we should worship God in spirit and in truth. Psalm number 8, verse number 3 up to verse number 6. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Hallelujah. Amen. Talking about you and I. Amen. We are able to do a lot of things in this world. Man is so powerful in this 21st century. Man has some amount of authority over anything else that is around us. But here, David tells us that whatever authority we have is a delegated one. Somebody gave this to us. And I remind you of the capabilities that we have as humans. God gave this to us. Are you an accountant tonight? God gave you the brain. Are you a pilot tonight? God gave you the brain. Is man able to build up these huge ships? Yes. But who is behind all of this? God is behind all of the successes of man. We are capable of doing so many things in this world. But don't you ever forget that there is a God who created you gave you all the capabilities, gave you everything that you are enjoying today. And as a result of that, he deserves our worship. He deserves our worship. We need to say thank you to God. Worship therefore becomes man's thank you to the Almighty God. I stand before God and I want to empty myself, I want to open up my heart, sink unto him, do all the things that he's asked me to do, because he's done a lot for me, and that is the only way I can express my gratitude to him. Worship, that is the idea. Do not allow anybody to force you to worship God. It should be something that should come naturally. You wake up in the morning and you just want to say, thank you, God. Think about your past. Think about where you come from. How many of us were born millionaires? Or how many of us were born by millionaires? It is just by God's grace. It is just by God's mercies that we are alive and that we are able to do the things we do today. Is it a hard thing for you to hear that we should present an acceptable worship unto him? No. It is natural. In fact, it rather becomes contra-natural if men decide not to worship God according to his word. 
God exists. He deserves our worship. And we need to do the things that he has asked us to do, not the things we want to do. You want to worship God, that is good. But there is something that we need to remember that if we refuse, in this 21st century, if we refuse to worship God, we are denying ourselves the needed spiritual strength that God bestows upon those who are faithful to him. Since creation, man has been incurably religious. If you choose not to be religious, that is your trouble. You go ahead and read all those books. Let them talk about the Big Bang. Let them deny everything about creation and call that scholarship. That is your trouble. God exists. He created us. He's given us capabilities. He gave us all these. You cannot tell me it just happened. I mean, look at the absurdity involved in the Big Bang Theory. In the beginning, there was something, something like, and the lecturer and the professor will be trying to describe that thing to you, and will be doing this, that there was something. What is something? What is the meaning of something? It was something like, 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 like an egg. It was like an egg. And then millions and millions of years evolved, and uh, you know this thing changed into an it like something. This is what we have in our books. That is all that man can do. And the other day they tell you there was a big bang, boom. And this balloon bursted. And something came out of it. It was an ape like something. Millions and millions of years evolved. And that ape was also evolving, transforming into different things. And that is who we are. That is all that the universities can take us to. When I believe in this, and I teach people, the government pays me, and I'm the big man. There was no creation, but that was the big bang. Genesis 1 and verse 1 would raise its beautiful head and say, In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. Ask the scientist, when did the beginning begin? I need an answer to that. Where did the beginning begin? Who wrote that book? Darwin? No. God exists. And we don't only have to just quote Bible passages, but try some points, and then uh, do some shorty work on worship, and that's it. No. And I know, as churches of Christ, I know what we're expecting. And we just read John chapter 4 and say, oh yeah, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. The Lord's Supper, it shouldn't be the introduction. It shouldn't be the beginning of the thing. The beginning should be faith. Are you having a relationship with God? Do you know him? Somebody wrote a song. Do you know my Jesus? He is not my Jesus. He is our Jesus. And all of us must know him. And once you get to know him better, you will want to worship him better. Amen. So tonight, let us go home, fortify our faith, pray a lot to the Lord, ask him to increase our faith. That is the shortest prayer I've ever read about in the New Testament. Luke 17 and verse 5. And the apostles of Christ asked him by saying, Lord, increase our faith. 
With increased faith, you can do a lot of things for your God. With increased faith, there are so many things God can empower you to do. And that, of course, includes how to worship Him in a more acceptable manner. How to worship Him in a spiritual manner. Well, man is incurably religious. And therefore, in your Holy Scriptures, Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 20, after the floods, when Noah and his descendants got out of the ark, the Bible says Noah offered sacrifice unto God. Since time immemorial, man has been religious. We must be religious. We must be people who believe in a God who created everything in this world. Nobody asked Noah to do that, but he did it. And you read further, and the Bible says God was so much pleased with the sacrifice of Noah. He was so much pleased to the extent that he changed his mind. He smelled the aroma from the sacrifice, the burnt offering from Noah, and the Bible said God felt so sorry that he had destroyed man like that. Oh, so man has two sacks. None of us is 100% sinful. And none of us is 100% righteous. That sinful man can turn into a righteous man and vice versa. We can do the right things. We just have to get the right information. I get the right disposition. We can do a lot of things to glorify our God. Because of sin, God destroyed the then world. And because of righteousness, he said, I will no longer destroy this world with floods. Behold, I am creating the rainbow. And whenever you see the rainbow, remember that I have sworn to myself and by myself that I will never destroy this world with floods any longer. Why? Because Noah decided to make a sacrifice unto God. Some of the times you can change the mind of God towards you. And some of the times you can change the mind of God towards others. So hard for you to understand? No. Isaiah chapter 38, King Hezekiah was so sick. He was about to die, and God sent prophet Isaiah to go to him and said, Go and tell King Hezekiah that he should set his house in order, because he is going to die. But what happened? The Bible says the king turned onto the wall, and he began to pray. He prayed and prayed and prayed. And I love the content of his prayer. Lord willing, we are going to tell you prayer is part of worship. Amen. And that is exactly what King Hezekiah did. And after offering that fervent prayer unto God, God sent yet another word to prophet Isaiah, told him, go and tell King Hezekiah that because of what he has done, I have added 15 years unto his days. That is why I'm telling you some of the times you can change the mind of God Amen. towards you. Amen. And some of the times you can change the mind of God towards others. Prayers. There will be a day or a night for prayers. And we'll be talking about that. But then, tonight, we want to think about all those who offered worship to God. Abraham did it. He was almost always sacrificing unto God. And the Bible says he became the friend of God. I want to become a friend of God. 
Abraham was somebody who was always ready to give something unto God. He was somebody who was always ready to obey God. Worship has to do with our obedience. Worship has to do with our obedience. Some of the time people can see it as high religious people. But God is omniscient. God knows we are human race. People see us going to church almost all the time. Is it bad? No. Attending church services is part of it. So it's not bad in itself. But how does God see you as an individual? Does he see you the same way people see you? Does he see you the same way you talk to people about yourself? I'm a Christian. I believe in God. That is verbal. That is what you have said. But how does God see you? Worship. The children of Israel were supposed to worship God in Exodus chapter 9 and verse number 20. You write it down and read it. God sent Moses to Pharaoh and said, I just want you to let my people go and worship me. Pharaoh, let my people go and worship me in the wilderness. God wants us to worship him. If we do not worship him, it will not take anything away from him. But when we worship him, we benefit. He blesses us. And so when he asks us to worship him, in a way he said, I want to bless you. Amen. To come for some blessings. So Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. That is what God told the, uh, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. I would like to read this one from the New Testament, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And I want to read from verse number 22 to verse number 28. Acts 17, 22 to 28. Listen to this reading. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. It is so interesting when our friends who claim to be atheists continue to enjoy themselves by saying, well, we don't believe in your God. And I keep telling you, he is not my God. He is our God. I don't believe in God. By professing, by telling me that you don't believe in God, that statement itself tells me you believe in God. Yes. I don't believe in God. If you don't believe in God, how do you mention God? And you know, this happened in Greece, where in the olden days, philosophy was the thing of the day. Almost everybody wanted to become a philosopher in Greece. And in the city of Athens, the Bible says they had a place called Areopagus. And here was a place that was meant for debating. People would meet over there either to tell strange stories or to hear strange stories so that they can think analytically so that they can come up with in philosophy what we call their syllogisms build up your syllogism you don't make sense when the philosopher tells you or a lawyer tells you you don't make sense it doesn't mean you are not a wise person but you are not speaking as you should legally there are rules for everything we do in this world. And in building up your syllogism, if you want to make sense, they say you come up with what you call the major premise. Build up your major premise. Build it well. After building that, you build up your minor premise. 
know that one well too. And then you come up with the conclusions. If the major premise is wrong, the minor premise cannot be right. Yeah. If the major premise is right, then chances are that we are going to be able to build up a good minor premise, thereby coming up with a conclusion. These are the things these people do at Aripagos almost all the time. Big, big English. They want to understand what is the meaning of that. When you say that, what should be the understanding? Okay, let us consider the punctuation marks of their statement. Let us try to go by the definition of that word. This is what these people were doing. And they thought they were on the top of the world. They were wiser than any other human being upon the face of this earth. And when Paul went there, you know what these people were doing? They had so many gods during the time. So this is for Diana, this is for this, this is for that, this is for that. And they have so many altars. And being philosophers, they thought that there will be a time that somebody might come and introduce a God to them that they never knew about. So why don't we erect one good altar here and write on it, this one is to the unknown God. So that whenever somebody comes in here and tells us there is a God somewhere that we've never heard of, we say, oh yes, this altar is for him. That is what we're talking about. So in their wisdom, that is what they were thinking of. And Paul being a lawyer, God chosen as